Last week, I just want to recap, I preached a message on pride, and the sermon title was Frenemy. <laughs> and that term frenemy actually means someone who appears as a friend but opposes you as an enemy, a rival, or antagonistic. And that is what pride is. It offers the illusion that it's looking out for you when it's not. Pride uh, appears to be your friend, that it's protecting you, but it's not. Um, if you want, you can listen to last week's, last week's message where I shared a very powerful poem that I often uh, visit from Beth Moore to help us kind of understand how pride is really just to, trying to make a fool out of you. Here's what we know from last week before we get into our conversation for this week. A man's pride will bring him low, but he who is of a humble spirit will obtain honor. Before destruction, the heart of a man is haughty, and before honor is humility. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Friendship with the world, which means more of a humanistic system, and friendship with the world, it's not talking about the people in the world, but it's talking about the world system, which is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, self-importance, um, makes us an enemy with God. Why is that? Because the Bible says in uh, point number five, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And today we're going to find our somewhat of a part two to this message uh, out of 2 Kings chapter 5. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 9. Again, 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. And although we spent a lot of time talking about pride last week, I want to talk a little bit more about humility this week. Can I do that? All right. So it says right here, Naaman. Commander of the army of the king of Syria was a great man with his masters and in high favor because by him the Lord had given him victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, which means he had courage, but he was a leper, which means he had a skin disease. Now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, would that my Lord were with the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy, speaking of Naaman. So Naaman went in and told his Lord, in other words, Naaman told his boss, thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, go now and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. In other words, the mistress servant, which served the house of Naaman, told Naaman that, I know somebody that could heal you. Naaman then goes tell his uh, boss that this girl said, I can get healed. So this kicks off the chain of events that's going to happen. So he went taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothing. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, when this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you Naaman, my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. And when the king of Israel read this letter, keep in mind, the king of Israel is not a believer. He tore his clothes. Typically in the Bible, when you tear your clothes, that means you're grieving, you're, you're sad. There's something that came upon you that is out of your effort to, to solve. So he tore his clothes and said, am I a God to kill and to make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he is seeking a quarrel with me. So this ungodly king actually thought the other king is picking a fight with him. But when Elijah, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king saying, why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elijah's house. My sermon title today is Unexpected Blessings in Unexpected Places. Unexpected Blessings in Unexpected Places. places. Spirit of the living God, we acknowledge your presence in here. Uh, we ask that you will give us revelatory wisdom and insight. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive your word. 
We come against every plan of the adversary that will try to rob the word from going forth. I declare that everybody at the sound of my voice in person and online is good grounds. And as they hear and apply the word, they will see some 30, some 60, some 100-fold return to the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, Naaman stood at the door actually seeking a miracle after hearing about a man he never met who can do something that was never done according to his experience. And we know that doors can represent an entryway to something. So here it is, Naaman, a commander of an army. And the Bible says he was a, a mighty man of valor, which means he was a courageous commander. And at the word of a servant girl, he has taken a risk and he's going to the house of Elijah, and right now he is at the door hoping to be cured of leprosy. Now, one can say that uh, Naaman was somewhat desperate because he went on the word of a servant. He went on, on the word of someone that was new to his house. Um, but let me say it this way. He took the possibility of the person's word because he needed a healing, <laughs> Sometimes being desperate is not so bad. Sometimes when you're at your worst, you can actually be at your best. In fact, the Bible says that God is nigh to the broken heart, to those that are broken and contrite in spirit. Because when you're broken, you'll finally stop trying to do it your way, and you might, you might now tag God in to do it his way. A lot of the significant things that has happened in my life wasn't when I was thriving in life. It was when I was broken and I tried everything else. And then finally, after trying everything else, all I had was God. And when all you have is God, that's still more than enough. So let me say this. If you're here today and you're desperate for a breakthrough, desperate for a move of God, desperate for God to do something in your marriage, in your business, in your finances, you're actually in a good place because you're in a posture to receive. You're in a posture to be low so God can bring you high. You're in a posture to not exalt yourself so God can exalt you. In fact, when you are at a desperate place, finally you may now submit yourself to the mighty hand of God so that in due season, due season means in a appointed time, not a time that you can control, not a time that you can predict, an appointed time, he will exalt you. Now, the thing about an appointed time is you don't know when that appointment is going to show up. But I want to encourage us today, don't be so focused on the appointed time, but just know that you got an appointment with healing. Just know that God has set an appointment with you for breakthrough. Just know that God has set up an appointment for you for salvation. I care more about having the appointment, the appointment than knowing the time. Because if you know that God has prescribed and prearranged and predestined, predestined blessings in our lives, then we begin to care more about the process than the outcomes. Oftentimes, we're more focused on the outcomes when God cares about the process. Because it's in the process you become more like Jesus. It's in the process pride dies. It's in the process selfishness begins to go away. It's in the process you learn that he's at peace. He, you're, he's your peace. Most importantly, in the process, guess what happens? You get humbled. Humility is an amazing quality to have. In fact, one can argue that humility is one of the prerequisites to step into breakthroughs, miracles, and signs and wonders because oftentimes the breakthroughs of God doesn't come the way you think it's going to come. Oftentimes the blessings that you're looking for is going to be packaged in unexpected places with unexpected people in unexpected situations. But if you're always going high and you don't know how to go low, you'll miss out that God might have prearranged some breakthroughs for you in low places. Somebody say amen to that. So if we are going to encounter the healings, the miracles, the breakthroughs, and blessings that are prepared and prearranged for us through the blood of Jesus, we have to embrace or embody a virtue, or what we call it here at Century, a habitude. Somebody say a habitude. 
we have to embrace the habitude called humility. Now, what is a habitude? A habitude is when our habits and our attitudes align with our belief about Jesus. I'm going to say that again. It's when your habits and your attitudes align with your belief about Jesus. Some people post their belief about Jesus, but their habits and their attitudes don't show that in their lifestyle. Which means you don't have a habitude, you have a hobby. See, hobbies you can pick and choose. You can, see, I, I, I have a hobby of going to top golf, which means I don't have to be good at it. I can pick it up when I want to pick it up, and I can put it down when I don't want to play it. Amen? I, I have a hobby to play basketball. I have certain hobbies. But to encounter the unexpected blessings in unexpected places, this can't be a hobby. It has to be a lifestyle. It has to be a habitude. It has to be something you're willing to put on every day. In fact, Philippians tells us, let this mind be in you as it was in Christ Jesus, who humbled himself and became a servant. He left his reputation and he humbled himself. And because Jesus humbled himself, he was giving a name that was above all names. That at the mention of the name of Jesus, that, that every demon must bow down, every, every tongue must confess that Jesus is Lord. Somebody say humility. humility. Now, uh, and, and if you, you can go on our website and see what our habitudes are. We, we have five habitudes that I believe helps us to become a multi-ethnic, multi-generation, multi-faceted church. And that's love God personally. That's learn empathy. That's live abundantly. That's lead humbly. I'm big in leaders picking up towels, not titles. I know you're an apostle from your church. I know you're a prophetess from your church. I know you are all of these things, but the highest title given to any man is servant of God. If you read the epistles, they will, they will start off saying a bond servant, and then they will give their second title. I am a bond servant first, then I'm a pastor at Century. I'm a servant first. In fact, when we make it to heaven, God is not going to say, well done, my good and faithful prophet. Well done, my good and faithful evangelist. Well done, my good and faithful pastor, teacher. Well done, my good and philanthropist. Well done, my good and faithful social media influencer. Well done, my good and faithful person who keep going viral. God ain't going to say none of that. What he's going to say is, well done, my good and faithful servant. Servant. You're a servant first before you're anything. This is why singles, if you're in here today, it's important to marry a servant. Because a servant is teachable. A servant is willing to learn. A servant is willing to make adjustments. A servant is willing to put you above themselves. This is why in marriage we need two servants. Because if I'm focused on meeting your needs and you focus in on meeting my needs, guess what? These needs are going to be being met in our house. But if, you, if I'm worried about you doing things for me, and, and you're worried about me doing things for you, and no one has the heart of a servant, then guess what? Nobody's needs are going to be being met. And then when nobody's needs get met, guess what we start doing? We start looking outside of our marriage, looking outside of our resources, looking outside of God's plan to bless you. If you're married in here today, just keep looking forward because I'm not picking on anybody. But, but, but if you're tempted to look outside of your marriage for emotional connection, physical connection, intellectual connection, maybe you need to start serving your spouse so you can activate some of that intellect, so you can activate some of that emotional connection. Because if you pray before you marry the person, everything you need is in the person that God led you to marry. You just ain't activating it because you're not serving them. I went on a tangent. <laughs> Bring it back. <laughs> Humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is not weakness. A lot of people misunderstand humility as weakness. Humility is not weakness. It is meekness. It is power under control. 
Humility is not weakness. It is meekness. You are not weak men if you have compassion. You are not weak men if you forgive. You are not weak men if you show that you are vulnerable. Ladies, you are not weak when you have to admit you were wrong and not always he is wrong. Sometimes we get in trouble for just taking a nap. I'm like, what did I do? I just, <laughs> just taking a nap. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm trying not to look at Stacy right now. <laughs> I'm messing with you, man. <laughs> but, but compassion, humility, serving, these are not weak qualities. How dare you say they're weak? The strongest, most masculine man, Jesus Christ, embodied all of these qualities. And I'm not trying to be like what the culture tells me to be. I'm not getting my version of femininity or masculinity from the culture. I'm getting it from the word of God. And my word says compassion is strength. Humility is strength. Kindness. These are virtues that come from the fruit of the spirit. So meekness is power in control. Yes, you have the ability to cuss somebody out, but you still don't do it. That's a hard one for me. It's very hard. But I have to, I mean, your pastor has to put on humility every single day. Not that I'm a prideful person, but sometimes when we feel like this should happen, or sometimes when we feel like I should have got this response, it gets us angry. And this is why when we feel these emotions, we have to choose humility. We got to catch ourselves. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. So humility is not thinking less of yourself. Here it is. But humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. I'm going to say that again. Y'all missed that one. I think Brother George, I think I heard that laugh. <laughs> Brother George got it. Humility is not thinking less. It's not looking at myself as unworthy. It's simply not having an exaggerated opinion about myself, an inflated opinion, a high opinion. Humility, in its essence, is seeing you, seeing ourselves the way God sees us, which is I'm more, he, he's more than able to do whatever he wants to do in my life. So humility, let me say it this way, it's not being too big for small things and not being too small for big things. Humility means I won't shrink in terror when there's an opportunity that looks bigger than me. And humility also means that I won't be boastful when I think there's an opportunity smaller than me. Because whether I think it's too big or too small, I'm doing it because of the God who called me to do it. Why? Because I'm a servant first. So let me say it this way. Humility is submission to God's mission above my own ambition. Humility is submission to God's mission above my own ambition. Paul said it this way, it is no longer I who live, but Christ that liveth in me, and the life that I now live, I live by faith in Christ Jesus. If we want to be humble it, it, in its truest, most rawest form, it's simply taking God's life above my life. It's picking God's way above my way. It's picking his plan above my plan. Why is that humble? Because you're acknowledging that he is the creator of the universe. You're acknowledging that the breath that we are breathing in our lungs came from him. And he created you. He knows the plans he has for you. So when I humble myself and say yes to a plan, to a virtue, to something that I don't agree with but God tells me to do, that's what it means to be humble. Amen? Amen. May I remind you that God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways. This is God speaking. For as heaven is higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Amen? So if we are to embody the habitude of humility, it will bring us to a door. But just like it took naming some humility to listen to his servants, go, uh, servants, uh, his his wife's servant. Let me say that better. It took humility for Naaman to listen to his servant in order for him to at least get to the door. So humility may help you get to the door, but there's something else that you're going to need to do to get what's inside of the door. 
Oftentimes, we get to the door of breakthrough, we get to the door of blessings, we get to the door of miracles, but then there's another test that comes that many of us, including myself, have failed at times. But we know scriptures are written for us so that we can learn from our mistakes. Anybody want to learn how to not just get to the door, but get what's inside of the door? Yeah. Amen. Well, before I do that, let's go to Colossians 3 and 12 before I share how to do that. Colossians 3 and 12 says this, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on. Somebody say put on. Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering. You have to put on humility like you put on clothes every day. It's not enough to put it on one day and not remind yourself that you need it every single day. I, 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 have, to, I have to wake up and confess that I do those things that are always pleasing to the Lord. I have to wake up and put on the fruits of the Spirit and when I'm saying I'm putting it on, I'm declaring it over me. I'm not asking for something God already gave me. Let me say that. I don't, keep, I don't need to pray something that God has already promised me. I try my best not to pray something that God has already given me, and I, pray my best, uh, I do my best to not try to ask for something that God is requiring of me. Let me say that, let me say that again. I think y'all missed it on that one. I try my best not to pray for something that God has already given me. And I try not to pray to ask God to do something that he requires of me. God has already given you the fruit of the Spirit. You already have humility. You already have patience. You already have kindness. You already have long-suffering. It comes in seed form. And every time you choose it, even though you don't feel it, it develops into not seed form but harvest form. But when I pray God to do something that only I can do, what happens is I don't experience, Lord, take this relationship out of my life. If it's not of you, remove it. Guess what? God ain't going to remove something that's unhealthy when he'd already revealed it to you that it was unhealthy. It's your choice to remove it. So you're praying for God to do something that he's giving you the free will to do yourself. So oftentimes, we are praying for God, God, just give me a sign. And every now and then, because you might be young in the Lord, God might help you with that. But there's some things that he needs you to do. He can't force salvation on you. He can't for help me forgive. He, well, all you got to do is choose forgiveness. Help me to love. Choose love. Help me to let go of this relationship. Choose to let it go. You know why you can't choose to let it go, choose to forgive, choose to do parts that only you can do? It's because you have not immersed yourself in the love of God. Perfect love cast out fear. You're afraid of what may happen if you let something go. Even though it's keeping you in bondage, it's familiar. And sometimes it's easy to stay in something that's familiar because we can control it. We know the outcome. Then when we have to give something up and now step into unfamiliar, unexpected places. But you got to go into some unfamiliar habits, some unexpected places to encounter unexpected blessings that God has prearranged, predestined for you to walk in. But you won't walk in it if you're not humble, if you're prideful. Um, one of the things that I love about humility, it, it, it requires, us, requires us to be teachable. Let's look at Proverbs 26, verse 12. Check this out. Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Sheesh. And, and, and the church says, sheesh. <laughs> Do you see a man or a woman in their own, wise in their own eyes? They won't listen to nobody. You got pastors and mentors that God has given you to listen to, and you just ignore all their wisdom. Wisdom is not always going to be packaged in, and thus says the Lord. Wisdom can be packaged in our parents. My parents offered a lot of wisdom to me that I didn't listen and I got older. And I was like, I made life so much harder on myself because the favor of God was packaged in my parents. Some of your favor of God, you may not have the parents I had, but you may got a nana. You may got a grandpa. You may got an uncle. You may got an auntie. You may got a spiritual mother. The, let me say, oh, I feel heaven on this one. The integrity of God will make sure the right voices are always in in your life. I like that. 
It might be a teacher. It might be a coach. It might be a pastor. But the integrity of God will make sure there is always somebody you got access to, whether you listen to or not, that will speak the oracles of God in your life. So, so the Bible says, the meek shall inherit the earth. It didn't say the proud. It didn't say the arrogant. It said the meek shall inherit the earth, the blessings of God. Humility is how you step into what God wants for you. I've said it often in one of my messages called Blind Spots a few weeks ago. Sometimes God will package your answers in people that you don't prefer. And it's not that he can't package in a person that you would prefer. It's to show you that sometimes you got to get out of yourself. It's sometimes to show you that, that you got to be willing to do something that makes you uncomfortable. God has packaged his glory and it's hidden in different places, not places that you normally would go look for because if you know where to look for you can stay prideful you can stay haughty but if you know that you got to get low you if you know that God can bring a blessing to a homeless person God can bring a blessing to a black person God can bring a blessing to a white person a Filipino person a Russian person and you prefer a certain race it makes you to get out of yourself and it causes you to trust God and not only did it does it give you access to a blessing it also changes your mindset about that particular group If you struggle with different things in your heart, God might put it in a person, group, or a race, or a culture of people that has your answer so you can break that which you keep praying to come off you. But if you're not humble, you won't be aware of how he's moving you. You won't be aware of how he's leading you. I think about, uh, I think it was about six, seven years ago, I was a youth and young adult pastor, and I was praying to God, Lord, I want to work full-time for the church. Now, let me say this way. That term, uh, I don't always like that because I believe you're always in full-time ministry, whether you work for the church or not, because there's always a full-time harvest out there. <laughs> what am I trying to say? Whether you work for the church like myself or you have another job, you're still in full-time ministry. Amen? Amen. We are all servants of God called to do the work of the Lord. But I remember there was a time where I felt specifically that God wanted me to have faith to believe to be on a church staff as a pastor. And this is something that I was praying for a couple of years. And I was bivocational, as many of you guys heard my story and you know that. But it just got to a place where I felt like I was hitting a lid in my professional career because I was feeling God draw me over here. And I get a, uh, I get like a message from somebody on Facebook, didn't know this person, and this person just said, hey, so-and-so that we both know said you can help me with this problem. And I was like, man, I'm not trying to, I don't even know this person. I'm not trying to help them with this problem. But, but, and I'm not saying that if you message me saying that I'm going to answer all of those either. <laughs> but because I protect my daily devotion. Because I walked with the Holy Spirit, I was able to be quickened when the Lord was saying, okay, you don't got to answer all of that one, but this one I need you to answer. And I remember entertaining this. So I met with this individual, and it was just about how I can help them in their ministry. And as I was having a conversation with this uh, person about helping them with their ministry, we both felt like God was a part of this this connection, this relationship that was forming from our conversation. And lo and behold, this individual is Pastor Dean. This was the guy who hired me as his associate pastor at Real Life Church. The, the point I'm trying to make is if I didn't go low, if I didn't keep the heart of a servant, I would have missed God bringing me an unexpected blessing in an unexpected place. I was not expecting to become an associate pastor after that conversation. I was expecting to just help somebody in a situation. But because I went low, because I took on the heart of a servant, God was able to show me something that I've been praying for. I believe there's some things that you're praying for, but you have not stepped into it because you're overlooking appointments. You're overlooking relationships. You're overlooking opportunities to serve someone, serve an organization, serve a church. You find the blessings of God serving your way to them. Promotion is for those who are servants, 
Somebody say amen to that. So um, let me say it this way. Humility also opens the door to uncommon and unconventional wisdom. It's, it's, humility gives us access to a wisdom that is uncommon to man. I want us to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 19 through 21. And Isaac, if I can get some pads, please. For it is written, I will dismantle the wisdom of the wise. I will invalidate the intelligence of the scholars. So where is the wise philosopher who understands? Where is the expert scholar who comprehends? And where is the skilled debater of our time who can win a debate with God? Question mark. Hasn't God demonstrated that the wisdom of this world system, which is pride of life, is utter foolishness? For in his wisdom, God designed that all the world's wisdom will be insufficient to lead people to discover of himself. God is saying in this passage that the wisdom of the world won't help them find themselves in God. The wisdom of the world is foolish to the wisdom of God. Check this out as we keep reading. He took great delight in baffling the wisdom of the world by using the simplicity of preaching the story of the cross in order to save those who believe. What is the story of the cross? It is I have to lose my life to find my life. That is the wisdom of God, that there is a life that Christ died for you and I to have. And the order and the only way to find it is you have to die to your current ways, your current beliefs, your current lifestyle that is contradictory to the will, the word, the plan, and purposes of God. Somebody say amen to that. I'm going somewhere. Let's go to drop down a few verses to verse 27. But God chose those whom the world considers foolish, the inmates, the prostitutes, the drug addicts, the extortioners. God has used the foolish things, the sinful people, the adulterers, the liars, the fornicators. God has used the people who were once these things that have repented, given their life to him to confound the wisdom of the people who think they're better than these people. (laughs) David had his issues. Moses had his issues. Rahab had her issues. All throughout the Bible is filled with people with issues. And as long as you got breath in your lungs, guess what? You got issues too. My gosh. He chose, let me say it this way, to shame those who think they are wise. And God chose the puny and powerless to shame the high and mighty. Man. He chose the lowly, the laughable in the world's eyes, the nobodies, so that he would shame the somebodies. For he chose what is regarded as insignificant in order to supersede what is regarded as prominent. Somebody, I need y'all to take a deep breath in, breathe in, breathe out. I'm going to say something, and it's going to be controversial, which means God may not use a political leader to save our world. He might use the, the Daniels and Josephs that are connected to that political leader. He might use a person in the administration to influence that leader. But I'm not looking for politics to be my savior. Because I live under kingdom politics. I live under a kingdom rule. The kingdom is higher than man's politics. I live under a different government. And while all can be going hell in the world, all will be well in my home. All will be well at Century. All will be well for the believers. All throughout the Bible where plagues will touch the pagan worlds, it didn't touch the believers who trusted and believed in God. We are in Goshen when there is a famine. 
We are in the good of the land, and we have to trust God that he is our Savior. And let me say it this way, and this is going to offend some religious people. I'm not mad when worldly people who don't love Jesus do worldly things that don't love Jesus. That's what the world does. But I am a little frustrated when believers start acting like worldly people. When believers are debating about right and wrong amongst each other in front of worldly people. The world is going to do what the world is going to do, which is be sinful, which is lie, which is to, to lift up their idols. And I'm not saying we should remain quiet. No, we shouldn't. We should declare the goodness of God. We should love the hell out of these people. We should stand on business, kingdom business, and be about our father's business. We are stepping in the time of the world where people don't want to hear what we have to say. They want us to demonstrate what we believe. That's why God has given us miracle signs and wonders. That's why we're declaring this is a house of miracles. Because when we go into a lost and broken world, typically when there are people who don't believe in Jesus, God will give the evangelist, he will give an anointing to do miracle signs and wonders, to lay hands on the sick and they recover, to cast out demons in his name. So those who couldn't believe the word that was spoken can believe the evidence that was shown. We are to pray for our ad- current admission, administration. We are to pray for our presidents. We are to pray for those in government. I pray for those that are in authority. I pray for those that are leading this country. I even vote. I even do all of the things that I'm responsible for. But my hope is not in a world system. My hope is in Jesus Christ in us, the hope of glory. So I'm not easily moved when something happens, when, when, when something happens that I wouldn't want to happen because my hope is not in temporal things. My hope is in an eternal God. My hope is in Jesus Christ. My hope is in the finished works of the cross. So I'm going to keep saving souls. I'm going to keep loving people. I'm going to keep declaring the goodness of God. I'm going to keep going in the world and saying, you are defiling my living God, you uncircumcised Philistine. God is good. I will chop the heads off of Goliath. I will stand up for my God, but I won't let the world get me angry to the degree I get sinful. Because there's only two kingdoms at play in the world right now. The kingdom of love and the kingdom of fear. And if you get in fear, you get in hate, you can't cast hate out with hate. You have to be a part of a better government of love to deal with hate. So I'm under, we're under a different kingdom. Although we are in this world, we're not of this world. We will do our part of how to make this world better but we're bringing our values and our virtues. Hear your pastor. I believe we should pray for the country. I believe we should stand up for immorality and say this is what uh, uh, morality should look like. I believe we should vote, and, and I believe we should do all of those things. But when it doesn't happen the way we want, our hope was not so connected to that more than it is connected to Jesus, which means whether the person I want in office is there or not, I still can love the person and pray for the person who is in office, who are voted something different than what I vote. Because we are a royal priesthood, a chosen generation, a peculiar people to share forth the marvelous things of the Lord. Check this out. For, though, for he chose what is regarded as insignificant in order to supersede what is regarded as prominent so that there would be no place for prideful boasting in God's presence. Next verse. We're almost coming to a close. For it is not from man that we draw our life. I'm going to say that again because some of us are putting our trust in man way too much. It is not from man or man-made systems 
that we draw our life, but from God as we are being joined to Jesus, the anointed one. And now he is our God-given wisdom, our virtue, our holiness, and our redemption. That word redemption means we were once lost and we were bought back. He purchased us to come back into fellowship with him, not just to be in fellowship with him so he can give us downloads to save people in this lost and dying world. Which brings me to the, my final point of Naaman, who was at the door, but there's something that he needs to do to get what's inside of the door. Check this out in verse 10, verse 14. And one can say that Naaman humbled himself a lot. He listened to a servant girl. He, he took a risk of just the possibility that this prophet can heal him. He's, he's putting himself out there. But even when he put himself out there, you, you, God still wants more from him. Even when you felt like you gave God all, God might say, no, there's a little bit more in you. There's a little bit more juice to squeeze out of you. Second Korean, uh, Kings, excuse me, chapter 5, verse 10 through 14 says this. And Elijah sent a message to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times. And your flesh shall be restored and you should be clean. But Naaman was angry. He was prideful. Seven times? What kind of instructions is this? Dip myself in a dirty COVID malaria type water seven times. Something is happening. God is breaking pride off of Naaman. You may have to do something not just twice. You may have to do something not just three times. You may have to do it seven times. You may have to forgive 70 times seven. In fact, seven is the number of completion. God might ask you to do something over and over. I already forgave them. We'll forgive again. I love. We'll keep loving. I was compassionate. We'll keep being compassionate. I did this. We'll keep doing it. Don't do it as a hobby. Do it as a lifestyle. If it's a hobby, you're going to do it three times and stop. If you're keeping score, you're going to do it five times and say it's their turn. But if you do it as a lifestyle, a virtue, a habit to, it doesn't matter if they love you or not, you'll love them. It doesn't matter if they curse you out, you'll bless them. It doesn't matter if they didn't clothe you, you'll clothe them. Because it is the lifestyle that you and I as believers are choosing to sign up for when we profess Jesus Christ as our Lord and personal Savior. And he went away saying, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord, his God. His God. It wasn't his God, it was Elijah's God. And wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. So check this out. He had an appointed time, but he was trying to control how he stepped into that appointment. <laughs> he thought, uh, I thought Elijah was going to be able to just do this and I was going to be healed. He tried to control the circumstances. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And in due season, you can't control the process if you want the promise. It's his promise, his process. His promise, his process. His promise, his process. His promise, his process. Say that with me. I needed to break something. His promise, his process. His promise, his process. You want to be married. There's a process called singleness. You want to be a business owner. There's a process called be generous. You want things that come from God that he promised, but there is a process that you and I have to go to if we're going to step into the promise of God. You can't have the promise void of the process. Are not Habana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all of these waters of Israel? <laughs> He's like, these are cleaner. Why do I got to go to the dirty water? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. He had pride. He had anger. He, 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 matter of fact, he brought all that money and all them clothes with him. He thought he was going to buy his blessing. Listen to you who are rich, you who are prominent, you who are prestigious. Yeah, you may be able to tell people to do things 
in your environment when you're in control, but in the kingdom you're not in control. The king of kings is in control. You can't buy certain blessings. You can't buy peace. You can't buy joy. You can't buy the healing power of God. You can't buy or you can't flex your influence enough for some of the things in God. The thing I love about God, whether you are high, whether you are low, we all got to go through the same door of humility. So whether you're rich or poor, whether you're broken or you think you're whole, whether you're this or that, we all got to go through the same door, Jesus Christ, because he is the way, the truth, and the light. And no one can get to the Father except through him. He is our door to salvation. He is our door to healing. He is our door to breakthrough. Jesus made it fair. Whether you are high, whether you are low, whether you are broken, whether you are weak, whether you are powerful, or whether you are powerless, we all got to go through the same door. So he turned away in rage, but his servant came near and said to him, my father, look how God is using this insignificant girl in this story to encourage and lead this prominent leader. Never think your influence is insignificant. Never think when the Lord leads you to say something or do something, it's insignificant. God, when his oil is on it, when his anointing is on it, he can use our words to sway kings. He can use our words to sway political leaders. He can use, the Bible says the king's heart belong in the hands of the Lord. And like the rivers of water, he directs it as he pleases. She said, my father, which means he probably saw her as a daughter. It is a great word that the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, wash and be clean? So he went down, dipped himself seven times in the Jordan. And according to the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Come on, my gosh. Which brings me to my last point. If you are to not just come to the door, humility brings us to the door, but following instructions gets us to have what's inside of the door. Instructions are always prerequisite to doing or having what God has for you. God gives us a set of instructions. You want your, your finances to bless? He said, tithe and give. You want your marriage to be blessed? He says, be selfless. There are always a set of instructions that God gives us that we not only just come to the door, but to get through the door and receive what God has for us. And in the Old Testament, it was the law. But the Bible says the law killeth, but the Spirit gives life. In this new covenant that we're in, we don't got to follow a bunch of laws because now we have the Holy Spirit and he writes the instructions of God on our hearts. That as you and I have a relationship with Jesus... We access the Holy Spirit who will say, I need you to forgive. I need you to bless that person. Oftentimes, the ridiculous is tied to the miraculous. My gosh. God might tell you to do something that's ridiculous to you, but it's not really ridiculous. It's killing your pride. It's killing that flesh. It's killing your own understanding that is getting in the way of you encountering the power and the presence of God. I want to end us on this note. We have to be childlike to receive the kingdom. We have to be open, humble, innocent, believing. My, my four-year-old, Dominic, man, he believes I'm a black belt when I say I'm a black belt. He believes I can do a triple somersault backflip in the air. He believes everything his dad can say. And God is saying we got to be childlike where we believe everything our heavenly father says about us. That if he says you are called, you are called. 
And I feel this by God. Somebody is running from their calling because you don't feel like you're good enough. You don't feel like you're worthy enough. You don't feel like you are dignified enough. And the blood of Jesus is sufficient to cover anything from your past, your present, and your future. If God called you, if he told you that he has a plan on your life, the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. The moment he gave it to you, he will not ask it back. It is always going to be there until you come see him. And until you fulfill that call, he's going to always be working his grace in and through your life.